I actually do not have a PowerPoint today. We are going low tech. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. So one of the things that vacation allows you to do is to sit back and read a good book, right? Anybody excited? Oh, some of you are shaking your head. I know. Uh, some of you are not readers. My wife is a, a ferocious reader. Uh, I... I kind of got burned out from reading going through grad school, but from time to time, it's good to pick up a book. And one book I often find myself, what? Oh, sorry. Uh, one book I often find myself wandering back to is a book called The Year of Living Biblically. Some of you have heard me reference this book before. Others of you haven't. Yeah, you've heard me talk about it a little bit. For those of you who don't know the story of this book, a gentleman by the name of A.J. Jacobs decided that he was going to live as biblically as possible for one year. Now, this was not because he is a religious man. He was raised Jewish, but admits he was more culturally Jewish and jokingly says he is actually as Jewish as Olive Garden is Italian. <laughs> he is actually a secular author, uh, works for a... Uh, uh, men's fashion magazine called Esquire, and his first major project that got him famous was that he decided to become the smartest man in the world by reading the encyclopedia from A to Z. Do you know what you become when you read the encyclopedia from A to Z? His word, annoying, because he often found himself pulling out useless trivia that would have even made Jeopardy say, where'd you come up with that one? So he decided he had to up his game a little bit and decided he was going to not only read through the Bible, but live through it as literally as possible for one year. Now, of course, this made for some interesting times, such as working at a men's fashion magazine and being told that you cannot wear clothes of mixed linens makes for a challenge. Everything has to be 100%. No blends. Um, what about the idea, of course, you know, here in America, wrestling with you cannot eat certain types of foods? Now, one that's interesting, and I'll do this as family-friendly as I can, though most of our kids here today are, are old enough, I can, I can just kind of say this. Um, there is a certain time of the month when women become ritually unclean. Uh, you are just... Unfortunately, you are unclean for about one week out of every month. And so you are told that you cannot have any physical contact with them. And that makes AJ, who is a germaphobe, very happy because it gave him an excuse to avoid all physical contact out of the possibility that this week could be your week that you're unclean. And that normally made him happy, although the first time it came around, it made him very unhappy, or should I say it made his wife very unhappy. Because when he told her that she's unclean this week, and that means that we can have no physical contact, and we can't sit in the same, like, we can't lay in the same bed or share furniture together. Oh, and by the way, I've got a sensitive back, and I really need the tempur bed, so could you go sleep on the couch? Let's just say it did not go well until the next day when he got home from work, and his wife realized the, the loophole. And so he gets home from work, and he goes to sit in his favorite chair, and as he's about to sit in his favorite chair, she says, you can't sit there. I just sat there. <laughs> goes to sit in the next chair. Can't sit there either. I just sat there, and there, and there, and there, and there, and the only chair she didn't sit in in the house was their two-year-old son's chair that looks like it's taken out of Crater Roll Sabbath School that's only about yay high. And so that's the only chair he got to sit in that week was the one where he had to put his knees to his shoulders basically to sit in. So it sometimes worked out, it sometimes didn't. But what's neat about the story is as he goes through uh, the, the journey throughout the course of the year, he does of course have some things that are like, how does this apply to modern times? But some of these things are little one-off special opportunities to, to interact with a special event. And so he is very intentional. I get one shot to try this. There are some things that he has to do, and he could try it again and try it again and try it again, such as uh, it took him, what was it, uh, 13 weeks before he kept his first, or had his first Sabbath, true Sabbath moment. And that actually happened accidentally, because... He went to the restroom, 
and he's in an old New York City apartment. And when he went into the restroom and he closed the door, the doorknobs fell off. And he was trapped in the bathroom until his wife got home three hours later. But one event that he decided he had to take advantage of, because he gets one shot to do it, had to do with the Jewish holiday system. The holiday that he definitely went all out for was the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Sukkoth, the huts or the tents. Now, this, of course, is a, uh, a holiday that we're very fam- or familiar with. Don't believe me? Where is everybody else? Where are all the people who are in these empty pews? They're out celebrating their own version of the Feast of Tents. They're camping. Ha ha. And if you don't know what that is, check us out in a couple of weeks when church is closed at camp, or the week of camp meeting because we are all celebrating our own little Feast of Tabernacles. Now, he, being in New York City, wanted to set up a tent on his roof. Superintendent said, no. Can I set it up? In the green, no. Can I? So he ended up having to set his tent up in his living room, which made the kids very happy and the wife very unhappy. But along the way, he started to ask questions about, like, what is this supposed to teach us? And he talked about, as he talked to his Christian advisors and his Jewish advisors, they talked about how this would actually help him better understand the experience of being strangers in a foreign land, the idea of we're not home We're just a passing through. And so that idea is something that sticks with me because we are doing a series right now known as No Place Like Home, right? Our idea of studying the tabernacle in the wilderness reminds us that not only is is God desperate to be with us because we are separated, uh, He wants to be with us so He sets up a tent, but really we are the ones who are on an adventure. We are the ones who are just a passing through. And so, yeah, it's a week-long camping trip, but for us, it's a lifetime camping trip until Jesus finally makes it all right, and we can go happily ever after because there's no place like home, right? So this week, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the holiday system, the feast system, and what it actually means and what it can do for us as Christians. And specifically, I want to deal with one feast, in, uh, one feast especially, and that feast is the Day of Atonement. Believe it or not, the Day of Atonement's coming up in about a week and a half. Don't believe me? If you read through Leviticus 23, verses 6, or 26 and 27, you're actually told that on the 10th day of the seventh month, it's the Day of Atonement. Now, spoiler alert, they were using a different calendar system. The Feast of the Day of Atonement is actually in the fall. But I can't help but appreciate the fact that the 10th day of the seventh month is the day before my birthday. And so every year on my calendar... I wrote what the uh, contemporary English version calls the great day of forgiveness. I have a calendar event to be intentional about my relationship with God. To think about what atonement means. And we're going to deal with the day of atonement and what it means to be at one, atone at one with God. And what I want to tell you today is that atonement is God's way of encouraging us to let go of sin once and for all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this chance. We have to be able to explore some of these special holidays that you built into your calendar with your people. Lord, we know that we don't celebrate many of them today because Jesus was the fulfillment of those ministries. But yet there's still something we can learn from them. And Lord, as we look at one in particular... Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand what it means that you are a God who will forgive and forget and see what that means for us. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, because we are going low tech, you will need your Bibles. Now that said, uh, if you are using a digital Bible, I still have my sermon notes up there. So if you're using the YouVersion Bible app, you can still, as uh, with other weeks, click in the bottom right corner, go to more, click on events, look for the church. You'll find all of my sermon notes right there. But for the rest of you, you're going to want to jump to Leviticus 4. 
Leviticus 4 will be the first thing that we have to deal with when it comes to these events. Because as we talk about God's tabernacle system, as we talk about the the campground that God set up for his people, because he wanted to be with us, and what did we say? Why did God give us this whole system? Especially why did God put the big grill out front? Well, it's because God wants to show us that he takes sin seriously. And so they are constantly offering sacrifices. And in fact, a couple of weeks ago, we did a sermon called Fire, where we actually set fire to our sins right? You remember that? Do I need to go get a lighter and our bucket of sins again? Okay. You got it. You got it. It might still smell remnant traces of of the, of the experiment, but there's something interesting about the idea of how God chose to deal with our sins. You've got your Bibles. You're in Leviticus chapter four. If you're there, say amen. If you need just another minute, say have mercy. You're there. So in Leviticus chapter 4, these are the procedures for the sin offering. And we are told down in verses 5 through 7, there's what, what we see here, specifically dealing with the high priest's sin. But it says, the high priest will take some of the bull's blood into the tabernacle. So it's not enough that the bull will be slaughtered and he will be burned. But you'll take some of the blood into the tabernacle, you'll dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the inner curtain of the sanctuary. The priest will then put some of the blood on the horns of the altar for fragrant incense that stands in the Lord's presence inside the tabernacle. And then you'll pour the rest of the blood out of the base of the altar for burnt offerings at the entrance to the tabernacle. So we see here that there's actually quite a sophisticated process of what to do with the blood. And most of it, of course, ends up, like you heard, being poured out right at the base of the altar. Most of it ends up outside to the point that I have heard it said, cannot verify it for myself, that if you go to Jerusalem and look under the Temple Mount, where the people used to offer sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, that the ground is still red from all of the blood that was shed there in that spot. But not all of the blood stayed there, did it? Some of the blood was actually supposed to be taken into the tabernacle and sprinkled seven times. We're talking about over 2,000 sprinkles a year. It is actually carried into the place that is God's presence. What a strange thing to do. Why would God, if the whole point of the ceremony is to teach that if you sin, you die, but thankfully we have a substitute, and and that substitute will die on our behalf, Uh, basically, if the whole point of the ceremony is to teach us what's going to happen at the cross, what's up with the blood that isn't a part of this service, is actually set aside specially for the service and used elsewhere? Well, here's where things get interesting. Because that sacrifice is actually something, or those, those saved portions have to be uh, dealt with at a different time. Those, dealt, those things are dealt with during the Day of Atonement. So, to put this into terms that we'll understand, about a month ago, we had our red cards, we offered our our forgiveness is we confessed our sins and then we had a chance to slaughter them by running them through a paper shredder. Now, of course, we were reminded that through the sanctuary system, this sacrificial system, the animals were often burned, which is the joke that I made because I preached that sermon on Father's Day weekend, and it talks about how God is a father. He has a giant grill, and most of the things that go on the grill become burnt offerings. How, how many of you had a father who made a burnt offering a couple of weeks ago uh, off the grill? Anybody? I told you my dad does. <laughs> yeah. So, now what's interesting is God set up a system because this wasn't the end of the sins. We still have leftovers. They're still retained through the process, and they have to be dealt with specially. And that's what the Day of Atonement's about. It is this special opportunity to cleanse from the various 
splatters and, and accumulated sin along the way. When we think about the holiday system, many of the holidays had a specific purpose, not only for Israel, but to point us to the one who Israel was supposed to be watching for. When we think about the feasts that the, the nation of Israel had to celebrate, they pointed to Jesus. They pointed to his ministry. They were just a, a glimpse of what we're going to go through, just like the idea that Jesus was the Lamb of God. And so they had the daily sacrifices that, that reminded us of Jesus, our Savior, who's going to die for us. So too, they had the feast of something like Passover, which is the idea that a lamb and cover the blood saves the house, all of those aspects. Some of these feasts, you guys could probably explain to me what the Christian application to Jesus and his ministry is. For example, one that was a few weeks ago, if I were to ask you to say, what about the Feast of Pentecost? That's a Jewish feast, but is it also a Christian one? Yeah. Is that when Jesus spread his ministry and really got things going uh, post uh, uh, post-ascension, it's time to get the church mobilized and ready for ministry. We could go through many of these feasts and talk about the Christian applications, but one in particular we tend to not talk about. We see it on the calendar, but then we just kind of let it go. It's the Feast of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And many Christians will struggle with the idea that there is a separate feast for dealing with sins besides Easter, Passover, and all that it had to do with Jesus' ministry on the cross. In fact, we've already been confirmed that there is something else that has to happen in this whole process just because we see that God had them set aside some of the blood as separate for dealing with later. This is all part of this process that would later be fulfilled by Jesus' ministry in the book of Hebrews, not just being our sacrifice, but also our high priest. There is still a work that needs to be done and only he can do it. Because remember, these sacrifices and the blood is for the sins of the high priest. Back in Leviticus 4, what we just read, that was for the high priest. Well, who's Jesus atoning for? Not himself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's on behalf of his people, of his church. And so we find the Day of Atonement explained. In fact, all of these holidays are given a, a real summary statement in Leviticus 23. And specifically down in Leviticus 23 and verse 26, the Lord says to Moses, be careful to celebrate the Day of Atonement on the 10th day of the seventh month, nine days after the Feast of Trumpets. You'll observe it as a holy day, an official day for the Holy uh, Assembly, as a sacred Sabbath and a day to present gifts to the Lord. Now, the Day of Atonement is a weird one when it comes to its place in, in Israel. Most of the holidays were quite festive. Israel has a lot of opportunities to celebrate and do some fun things. But this one is the only one that is described as being like a Sabbath, as a solemn time. It is a day where they were to refrain from marital relations it was a day when they were to especially prepare their hearts and their bodies for the sacred, um, the sacred moment with God. Now, the actual Day of Atonement service was a very intricate service that involved over 20 steps, things like three clothing changes. Could you imagine if we treated church service like the Oscars and every time pastor gets up to talk, he's wearing a different suit? That's basically what the Day of Atonement was. Every time they turned around, they had, the, the, the priests had different clothes on because they all had something different to help them understand that role and, 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 and what, what is going on with the Day of Atonement. You also have multiple sacrifices, bulls and rams, and then you have this whole thing with goats. Now, the interesting thing with the goats is it wasn't just one goat, it was two. And this is one I saw uh, about three months ago on social media, it really blew up that some guy called out the Seventh-day Adventist church on social media because we taught that one of the goats, one of the goats wasn't Jesus. Did you know that? It was a big deal. We're a cult because of the two, because we say that the two goats, one of them was Jesus and one of them wasn't. And he thought that we were wrong, that both goats were Jesus. That's weird, isn't it? In Leviticus 16, we are told that they should take two goats, and one of them is to be called the Azazel. It's delivered for Azazel, whereas 
Uh, the other one is offered for the Lord and for the people. The one that's offered for the Lord is killed. The other one takes the weight of the responsibility of all of the sins and is put on them and they're sent away and said, get out of here, go away, we don't want to deal with you anymore. Now when you think about the two goats, one of them being offered on behalf of the people, it dies on their behalf. Which one does that think remind you of a little bit? Jesus and his ministry. Now the other one that they say, the weight of sin, the, the responsibility of sin, it's your fault. Get out of here. Who does that sound like? It sounds like Satan. In fact, if you remember our studies in Revelation last fall, you know that there's a period where Satan is cast away from the people into what's known as the abyss. And so we, when we look at the second goat, it fits a whole lot better with the idea that, yes, some of this responsibility is going to go on Satan. We're going to get rid of it once and for all, away you go. Now, it's, it's funny because the first goat definitely died for the people. The second goat was definitely not supposed to be slaughtered because slaughtering is a, a sacrificial concept. And this one is not sacrificing anything. It's his fault. You can't sacrifice him intentionally. But that last word is a, it's kind of a fun word, isn't it? You can't kill him intentionally. But the people got kind of nervous about this other goat. The people were kind of worried about what happens if this cursed goat wanders back to camp? You know how some animals just kind of show back up after years of being lost? What if this evil goat comes back? Then what? Like, are we back in our sins? And so they figured out the best compromise was to simply say, you know, if we don't actually directly push the goat off of a cliff, but he just kind of happens to fall off on his own, like, it's not our fault, right? And so that's what they would often do. I know it's kind of crazy to think about, morbid to think about, but these people would, would sacrifice this goat. Correction. They wouldn't sacrifice this goat but they would still put the weight of the responsibility of the sins on this goat. And this was a major part of the service, is to distinguish between the sins forgiven and then the sins that remained. Because there was a burden of responsibility. There is the taint of sin that still remains. When you wrong somebody and you apologize... Does that automatically make everything identical and like it was never happened? No. There is often some sort of hurt and there's some sort of process of we've had a broken relationship. In fact, that's how I way back when defined when I used the word sin. Sin is a broken relationship. And that process of reconciliation takes some time. And so what we see here is this acknowledgement that yes, there are some sins that, like, sins are forgiven, but the burden of sin still lingers around. There is a day when it'll all be dealt with, but it takes some time. And so this is actually where our sermon title comes in. The day that God forgot. Because when we look at some of the great promises that we have of Scripture, have we ever thought about what we might actually be overlooking when it comes to our relationship with God? For example, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, we are given clear encouragement of how we can get rid of our sins. This is a verse that I read to you before, and I'll read it to you again, and I'll read it to you again after today, because this verse matters. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, period, and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. We have a forgiveness and a cleansing. Cleansing is a very interesting word because that is the same word that shows up in relationship to what they do in the Day of Atonement ceremony. This is not just a day of forgiveness, but it's a day of being cleansed. You remember our scripture reading, Jeremiah 
In Jeremiah 30, what was that? Jeremiah 31. We were given the statements on the new covenant. We we're about to partake of communion. What is communion about? The cup of the new covenant that God makes with us. And we are told, this is the new covenant I'll make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. I'll write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. And that's where we often stop when we talk about the new covenant. It's about a new relationship that God wants to put his character on our hearts. They will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone will already know me, says the Lord, and I will forgive their wickedness. And she read, and I will never again remember their sins. The Day of Atonement is a day that not only does God forgive, but God forgets. In just a couple of weeks, there will be a wedding here. How many of you have ever attended a wedding? Anybody here ever been to a wedding? There you go. How many of you remember the verse that is almost certainly going to show up in, if not this wedding, but just about every other wedding you've been to, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. You may know it as love is patient, love is kind, and so on and so forth. Do you know what one of the statements of love is in 1 Corinthians 13? Love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way, it is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. What an interesting idea to show up there. The idea that love doesn't keep track of wrongs. This is a day that God forgets. Now, to clarify something, does God truly forget? Is it that if you ask God, do you remember that sin that I did seven years, three days, two hours ago? And God would be like, what sin? I have no idea what you're talking about. Is he being legit or is he being like a parent who just kind of plays along with the, oh, yeah. No, I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to forget about it. Is it more the God can't remember or God chooses not to remember? God chooses not to remember. That's how I understand this. It's not that God can't remember. It's that he will choose not to. And this is really important because if God can choose to not remember our sins, one of the things we need to do is not encourage him to remember our sins. How do we encourage God to remember our sins? By doing them over and over and over again. That same thing that we ran through the paper shredder and then we burned. And then we turn around and try to jigsaw puzzle it back together. And do it all over again. God takes our sins so seriously. He says, you know what? I don't just forgive you. I'm ready to move on. And atonement is that opportunity to encourage each of us to also let it go and move on. It's that once a year opportunity to say, you know what? I want to set things right. I want to make things whole. And I want to be better than I was in the past. And I don't want to go back there ever again. I'm done with it. I want to let it go. And that's what, to me, atonement is. Like I said, atonement is God's way of encouraging us to let go of our sin once and for all. So, Israel, on a daily basis, had the chance to come to God for forgiveness. Right? Every day, relationships made new. God, I'm sorry. Help me do better. But even with forgiveness available on a daily basis, it was still good for them to take a regular, intentional, special opportunity to say, I'm actually going to meaningfully take all of this seriously and be ready to truly let go and move on. 
Now, we today as Christians, we don't have to celebrate with sacrificed animals. I didn't bring a goat here today. No ram, no bull. Because as a Christian, we already had a lamb, right? And that lamb actually gave us a ceremony as well that we can use to especially remind us that God has chosen to forgive and to let it go and to help us to forget and move on. And that's what we're going to partake of soon, is communion, is the chance to be reminded that God has already taken care of this for us. He's already shed his blood. He's already broken his body for us. And if we can forgive each other, I'm sorry, if God can forgive us, can't we forgive each other? There's a parable that Jesus tells in the book of Matthew about how a servant has accumulated some 10,000 talents of debt, the equivalent of 10,000, basically 10,000 lifetimes of debt. And he asks for just, you know what, give me time so I can work it out because I'm sure I can work my way through my own debt. Can we ever work our way through such an enormous pile of debt? Of course not. The owner, the master, decides to do something that only he can do. And he says, you know what? I forgive you. But you know what's heartbreaking in this parable? Is that that servant then goes to another and says, hey, I just remembered you owe me a hundred denarii worth of debt. hundred denarii, basically a summer's worth of wages. You owe me a summer's worth of wages. You pay me everything you owe me or else. And the master hears about this, and how does he respond? You know what? If you can't forgive him, I'm not going to forgive you. Because the master might have forgiven, but he didn't forget. And we know that this is all coming together because we are living like we weren't forgiven, and we made it, poss- we made it impossible for the master to forget. And so that's why it is important to take this idea of foot washing seriously. What we do in accordance with the custom that Jesus has given us in John 13 is we're going to break in just a moment to go for foot washing. And it is a great chance to be cleansed for our transgressions. Maybe the person who will be doing your cleansing, you may have a personal thing that you need to deal with. Something where you'll say, you know what? I am ready to not just forgive but I'm ready to forget. That dirt on your feet from where we walk those dusty roads, that's gone. I'm ready to move on. But of course, in the Day of Atonement, it is also possible that somebody on behalf of the community could offer that forgiveness. And so maybe you choose to foot wash with somebody else from the community. And you just need to be reminded from God and from another human being of what it means to let it go, to forgive And to forget, to be cleansed and made whole with God and with others. And so here in just a moment, we're going to head downstairs. Correction, where are we going? Yeah, he's saying out there somewhere. There's tables set, or there's chairs set up downstairs in the fellowship hall. Those will be used by the... By the women in the fellowship hall? Okay. The men are going to the... Any of the rooms down the hallway, I'm hearing. If you need a special space as a family, perhaps as a husband and a wife or with children, and you need to make things right, is there a space for you? You could head to those spaces, one of those two spaces if you need to. There's plenty of room for you to be able to forgive and forget and to be cleansed as we prepare to partake of our our communion in just a few moments. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this chance that we've had to take a look at the Day of Atonement. It might seem like just a thoroughly Jewish thing that was just done away with. It's not something we have to worry about anymore as a Christian, but in fact, quite the opposite. Your death on the cross was the sacrifice that we needed 
but there is still ministry to be done, and we're thankful that you are our high priest who offers that forgiveness, but also the cleansing that comes with it. And so, Lord, we're thankful for what you have done and are doing to make us at one with you through atonement. We know what you're doing, Father, but help us to also know what we do or what we need to stop doing to take you seriously, to take the forgiveness, to take the cleansing, to take the blessings seriously. We are thankful for your gospel in all of its stages. Lord, I pray that we would be able to live like that in our relationship with you and our relationship with others. Lord, maybe there's somebody in our lives that we need to just, we've, we may have forgiven them, but we don't forget. Lord, maybe there's somebody that we just need to let go. There's somebody we just need to, 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 to just cast it off and say, that's not a part of my life anymore. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would take that, take what we're clinging to, that's keeping us from fully embracing all of the goodness that your gospel has to offer. And Lord, take it away. No more part of our community, no more part of our lives. Take it away, Lord, so that we can come to your table and receive grace and forgiveness with nothing holding us back. So Lord, be with us as we break for our communion. In Jesus' name, amen.